Welcome to Any Given Chance Podcast, stories about passion and sacrifice, what actually goes on behind the scenes in the consistent chase of everything. We're going to bring you some untold stories, some of people you know, some of people you don't. These stories that we bring on with our guests are nothing short of inspiring and will get you out there chasing your own goals as well. Join me, your host, 3AM365, Matty Menon, as we dive into these incredible stories. And of course, as the podcast grows, so do we together. So stick with us from the start, hit that like and share, subscribe button, get your family and friends involved, and we'll see where we are in a 100 podcasts. No days off, no excuses. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Any Given Chance podcast, podcast about passion, what goes on behind the scenes. I love it. But before we jump into today's guest, got to give our sponsors a pump up. Number one, Squad Athletica. The best training gear, getting around. You've got to get on there. Go see their Instagram, SQD Athletica, or jump online and you can check out their shop. Throw in your any given chance code AGC. That'll give you a little discount at the end. Black Rose Barbers, the boys around the corner over near the Mermaid Fitness. Oh, not Fitness First. It's Good Life now over there at Carabunya Street. Liam and the boys will hook you up, make you look like a million dollars, I tell you right now. Steak Kings, where you get all your dry age steak. And of course, our big new major sponsor, Big shout out to them, Ultra Bet. That's right, an Australian-owned bookmaker. Fuck these overseas guys, Ladbrokes, Sports Bet. They've all sold out. They're all taking your money overseas. At least these guys are Australian-owned. And if you're going to have a punt, of course, gamble responsibly, but do it through there. We are then able to take that cash and sponsor athletes. All the guys that we see on this podcast, the Nantes brothers, Popey, all the guys that are in the midst of it, Finney, Finney Askew. You know, we can support them in their journeys on becoming world champions in their chosen sport, of course. So there it is. Uh, make sure you give us a like, share, subscribe as well. So without further ado, here we are. I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but I am so stoked and pumped. Mr. Keegan, Hippo, Scrawngrave, Skitsgrave, Gold Coast favourite, Hitman. He's also the Gold Coast favourite son. Keegan Hipgrave, welcome. Brother, I love your energy so much. I just knew that this is going to be a mad potty. So, brother, thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here. Yes. Welcome home. Where have you been? You've been down Sydney. Mate, I've been in Sydney. I've been in Sydney for the last probably two or three years years now but I, mate, I love the coast like i grew up on the gold coast as you know i mean i try and get up here as much as i can mm. flight flew in last night woke up there's not a cloud in the sky it's, it's a bloody beautiful morning got a little bit of a swim this morning so mate i'm, I'm frothing a beer it's god's country up it's here it's the eh? best mate it's the best you've been doing much surfing down sydney or uh mate, i do a little bit i just mate it's a time thing right like yes. it's going you mate, you get it better than anyone trying to allocate time so mate, it's been busy with like work training and then trying to find time for a wave like i'll, I'll get out a little bit actually i I surfed Tamarama not too long ago. It wasn't as crowded. Like I, I live out of Maroubra, which is sick. Like it's cool. I always said like, as long as I'm close to the beach, I'll be sweet. Like I'll be fine. Maroubra is great, but it's just busy, mate. It's just busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, and everyone, yeah, it's just, mate, you know what it's like. It's, yeah, it gets a bit bit crazy sometimes. Yeah. But, mate, yeah, as long as I'm close to the beach, I can have a little swim here and there. I'm good, brother. Yeah. I'm good. Reignite that energy, get in touch with the ocean, get the salt water through your veins. I don't know what it is. Like, if it's, uh, if I can get it, if I can get in the water in the morning or even in the afternoon to wash the day off, I just feel like so much more refreshed. Yeah. I just feel better. I, it's, I don't know. It's something about it. I don't know if it's just because we've been around it since we were kids or what it is, but I just feel good afterwards. Yeah, you know? every single time. And like, as we grow older, like I'll go check it and I'll go, oh, it's not full foot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it looks a little bit cold. We're starting to get a little bit tentative as you get older, but no, but once every time you actually get in there, get in the water, come out, you're just like new person. You've, How good? You're just refreshed. You, and even like if you've got a big day, if I have a huge day and I'm stressed out or whatever, I'll go for a swim and I'll come back and it's just like I wash the day off me. Yeah. And I come back and come home and I'm not, I'm not taking all that stuff home. So yeah. it's great. Man. Cleans it's great. the soul. That's it. That's what it is, doesn't it? It cleans you, the soul. Brother, you get it. You get it. Oh, well, mate, why Sydney? Why, why are you hanging down there? Obviously, my, my background's footy. My background's NRL. Yeah. Um, I retired from the NRL a couple of years ago, but I moved to Sydney for with the Parramatta Eels. So yep. I guess my background real quickly is I did most of my junior development with the Broncos, with the Brisbane Broncos um, under 20s competition, which was really cool. I uh, got to play with the guys like uh, Paddy Carrigan, Payne Hatch. Actually, we, I was talking to my old under 20s coach yesterday and we we're going through the boys who have kicked on to play in the NRL. Yeah. There's so many crew. 
like Paddy, Paddy obviously, Payne, Keenan Palacia, Katoni Staggs, Herbie Farnworth, guys who have moved clubs like Jai Arrow, um, Joe and Gowie, like our whole, I, mean, I could go through the whole team and pretty much everyone's played great, which is a credit to the Bronx, like junior system, it's unreal. Um, anyway, I went to the Titans for five years where obviously we we met up with the great Anthony Don and Mitch Rain and we had a, we had a couple of good, good surfs and we had a fantastic surf trip over in the Mets, which was cool. But then after that, mate, I, I moved to the Parramatta Eels, which was great just to, just to finish off my career at a, at a ripe old age of 24. Mate, I was medically retired, as you probably know, um, with concussion, but I stuck around. I stuck around in Sydney. It's not going to be forever, but it, it's cool for now. Yeah, setting up shop. Well, let's dive back into that. How did you get into footy? Like, was it in your blood? Is it, is, you know, do you come from a rugby league family or what, what is it? My old boy used to play. Yeah, yeah. my old boy, he, he, I think he, he said he was quite good when he was in, in high school, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I've never seen any footage. But no, he, he did his ACL when I think he was about 18 or 19. So he didn't kick on after, after that. He was one of those guys that you know, I think when you do your ACL back then, they couldn't reattach it. It was pretty much no. he was running around with no ACL. Marky, old man Menion, he hasn't got one. They, yeah. just, they went, oh, we might be able to do that. And he's like, oh, no, don't worry about it. Still going around with it today. And he's running around. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. So, mate, he, he used to play. But didn't not a huge like obviously my, my old boy my whole family loves footy yeah. so that's how I kind of got into it. I started playing it under eights at Southport Tigers for a year. Moved to Narang Roosters, the old, old Narang Rooters, which was good, mate. Very heavily Polynesian background in Narang, which was really cool. We were the tough sort of grubby grubby team. Yeah. I little guess I guess that's why I was so aggro when I was playing footy. <laughs> I think I was that was nurtured with that. But no, nah, mate, it was cool. So I got into footy. I guess I kind of had some really great role models around me. Paul Harrigan being one of them, the chief. Uh, he was an Australian, obviously Australian footballer, played State of Origin, captain the Newcastle Knights, like one of the greats. His parents and my grandparents were really good friends. We're just really great family friends. And we would holiday every year together at Crescent Head. Yeah, right. Cracking spot. Like we would spend a month at Crescent. We'd be surfing every day. Paul would be on the sand I guess like playing touch footy with all the kids. Like he was that kind of guy. Like yeah. he, he wasn't just a great athlete. He was also the best person. And he was probably someone who I looked up to. Like he had respect from all of the players. Like I remember hearing stories from people around, I guess the caravan park of, you know, just how everyone respected him and how he always gave time for everyone and how he was just so genuine and caring and nice. And I guess that was something I looked up to and not only a hard, tough player. So when I was coming into grade, I was like, that's someone who I want to be like and that's someone who I want to play like. Mm. So I guess, yeah, I had that really competitive nature, like style of footy that I just I kind of got nurtured through. Like people like, I remember all my coaches said, don't lose that aggression. Like don't lose that aggression because it kind of what sets you apart from everything else. And mate, to be honest, I wasn't that skillful as a player, but I would just go hard. So that's what I did. But then also to the side of that, it was like, yeah, he, he went hard and he, and he played hard, but he was also such a great person off the field. Yeah. Um, and he had a really great family. Um, he had some really great parents and good people around him. So I guess that's kind of where I want to start. Anyway, long story short, yeah, got into footy and <laughs> just kept playing. Mate, I, I can contest for that for you. Like, like watching you cross that line, animal coming off the line, nicest human in the world. <laughs> so to be able to control that switch, because a lot of players can't control that. A lot of players don't know because they're adrenaline junkies. You know, you're, you're in a, a forceful sport. You're getting bashed. You're getting body contact every day of the week, no matter what. Now, then you take them into a different situation and they can't switch off. They're still in that like high adrenaline rush, need to be hit, like putting them in bad situations with alcohol and drinking and anywhere. So for you to have that ability, and I think now I understand because I've never heard that story with Paul Harrigan, but he was, he was the same animal on the field, absolute animal off the field, like you said. He's the chief, he's, he's the best. He's the best. And like you look, like you look at those um, old footage of Paul and uh, Carol, Spud yeah. Carol, like running off the kickoff and they knock each other out. And I remember looking at that and like, kind of like looked up to that like that was something that I really wanted to do and even playing footy I don't know I just it was always this thing that as soon as I crossed the line it would just a flick would just switch and I'd be like I need to be the best like most competitive player on this because I wasn't really relying on anything else I was just relying on the fact that I wanted to work harder and out compete everyone while I was playing like Carl Lawton he would, he, we end up playing against each other a couple times like he was at the Warriors then went to Manly and even players in the other team would be like, is Keegan sweet? Like, he's just bloody 100 miles now on the field. He's a bit of a grub. Like, he's like, is he sweet? Like, is he all there in the head? He's like, mate. And Carl, Carl is like one of my best mates, obviously. Yeah. And he's just like, he's 
the night like he's a good guy like he's a nice guy ever just as soon as he gets on the field he, he's wild yeah. and then obviously mate footy's a small world once you start knocking around with a few of the boys and even rugby leagues an even smaller world once you start getting to know a few of the boys it's like mate like remember when we used to always have run in sam sonny when he came to the Gold Coast Titans a couple of years before we were playing Warriors in a trial match um, and me and him sort of went at it. We didn't throw any punches, but we were just going back and forth all game. Me and Nathan Peets, we actually shaved our head, skin head the night before just for something fun to do. I don't know. We're just taking the piss, I think. We shaved our head, so we were full skin head and we went out, we were playing in Sunshine Coast and we were, came up against the Warriors in like a trial match and me and Sam Lasoni just went at it for like the whole game and there's this really great photo of me and him like holding each other like hand, like head on head, like fist on fist, like ready to go and Pete's in the background as well. So it was like me and Pete with these two shaved heads looking like absolute like thugs <laughs> and Sam's a big dude. Anyway, Sam came to the Titans a year later or two years later and I showed him the photo and we were just laughing and we got on so well. He's like, man, I thought you were the biggest scrub. Like I thought you were like just a dickhead and we got on really great. Like he was, he was probably one of my really good friends in the team, but it just shows like, yeah, once you're on the field, it's, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. It gets pretty heated, but if you, you got to be able to step off the field and, and be able to just, you know, 100%. I think I can remember one battle that I had. Um, well, it was Sunshine Coast. I was rounding out my career, retired at the grand old age of 27, I think. But we're playing East and I was having um, a running, same thing in the game, with the hooker. And blonde hair, surfy guy, you know, because I've lived in, in the water and still played footy. Not my smartest decision, you know, surf four hours and then go try play footy in the Queensland good luck, Cup. Mate, good luck, good Not a good idea. But, yeah, just into me, you surfy fuck, rah, rah, all these sort of things. And, you know, he got me a good shot and I've come down over the top and just went bang with an elbow, split me. And I heard him get up going, did you get him? Did you get him? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I said, like burning up anyway i don't know if he cop, copped a, a shot in the nuts or if he was just blowing like because it was so much but he's sitting on there going like throwing up like that and i'm running past and i've caught it and just rubbed it all in his face <laughs> <laughs> caught it and just went like that going, ah. and he's after me because he's blowing so a couple more after it, but after the game, man, will we laugh? And I've got blood pouring down here. Yeah. He's got still bits of spew all over his face, but that's the best way to do it, though. Like, oh, it, yeah, it, people take the game so seriously, right? Yeah. And especially fans, like they can't they can't decide for the fact that it is just a game of footy. Like, yeah. and, and to be honest, most of the boys get on up like after the game. Yeah. Like, obviously, there's those rare occasions where you know you might be off someone or whatever it is, but it's mate, it's a game of footy yeah. at the end of the day. Like, yeah which is pretty wild. You got to respect the other people because they're in the, they're in the same trade as you. So yeah, it still might be heated because you either lost or win and you can't take it. But I'm sure if you spoke a day later, you'd be like, oh, that was like, a good game. Boys are so, so competitive. Like I remember I did their power awards night last week and they obviously got knocked out of the eight. They played the grand final last year. They've been playing semis I don't know, for yeah. the last couple of years. And the boys were so disappointed. Like they were so disappointed. So they, they were so close of, being in the top eight, they played Penrith Panthers in the very last game, big game, and they they pumped them. They played that unreal. And Penrith and Para like a big rivalry. Yeah. Like when I was at Para, that was always the biggest game that everyone got up for. And then they won the game. Penrith are gonna probably gonna go on them and they might win the comp. Like they're obviously coming first at the moment. Like they're they're killing it. And they're they're obviously tipped to win it. Um and we we smoked them. So it just shows that we like Para, they are they can be in the eight. Like they they're a top eight side, but they just obviously for whatever reason happened throughout the year but the boys were filthy and the boys were so filthy clint gutherson got up one player of the one player of the year like the ken stephen thornton sorry ken thornton medal he won it and he was just so angry and all the all the conversation afterwards was like we're disappointed like this like we wish we were still playing finals and you just it, there's this like inbuilt competitive nature in them that yeah it's so hard to turn off it's hard when you know you should be there as well it's a bit different when you know you know you don't deserve to be there it's even though it's like oh we want to be there you know i'm coming in the last wooden spoon or something like that you're like yeah okay we we need to fix things first yes. but when you've done that beaten the top team smoked them should be competitive and you've fallen short of getting in there and you know you're better than three or four teams that's a very hard pill to swallow and then you've got to go back and look at your performance and go all right where was it where where did we where do we change? And rugby league's such a busy game now. It is such a busy game. And that Penrith Panthers are so good. This is what I see. They're all in that age group of, you know, 23 to 29 men. They've come out of the, you know, 19 young gun. They've built into their bodies. They're at the perfect age, perfect, you know, size. They're all going well together. A couple of big leaders outside of it. Bang. How good. 
Um, it mate, it's exactly the same as the Brisbane Broncos, right? Yeah. Like those, they're a young team. And most of those boys, we were playing under 20s together. Yeah. They're like, there's got to be eight, nine, 10 players in that squad that we were all playing under 20s together. Like they were all, like they were all in it. Herbie Farnworth, Payne, um, Payne Haas, Paddy Carrigan, Keenan Palacia, Katoni Staggs. There's so many boys that came through that under 20s competition, competition and you have that bond together. Like they're, they've got such a strong bond. Like look at them, the game last night. Yeah. Hey, they pumped Melbourne Storm, who's a top four side. Like they're, like they're a gun. Yeah. And, and just shows that, yeah, that they have that mateship and being able to play together for a long period of time. And that's the hardest thing, being able to keep those plays together because usually they're killing it and they're going to get offered big cash from elsewhere like same with Penrith, same with Bronx for next year. Uh, so it would be cool to see what Bronx do this season. Yeah, because they're all in around that 60 to 150 game. Yes. So I noticed that the Titans and sometimes that have 200 game players, three game players. Yeah. There's no, and that, I think that's that perfect rhythm where they find that, you know, middle-aged men, they realize they're not, oh, I'm playing NRL. They're like, I deserve to be in the NRL and we're going to win a comp. And they're all in that, you know, that small group. There's no division and Penrith have, hit that nailed that on the head for the yeah. last three four years clubs some clubs do it really well like at <laughs> titans we went through three club rebuilds we went yeah. through, i went through three coaches in a matter of like five years do it this way do it that way neil, no no no. we're gonna do it this way now neil henry when i first got there debuted in 2017 then we had garth brennan for a couple of years and then we had justin holbrook on the back end of it there's three coaches that you learn from in three, in five years yeah right? it's how, how do you get that consistency right it's i tough. always say that about ash taylor signing for big dollars like oh, take the money mate well done but then he's gone from being coached by wayne bennett system 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 this is what i get if he would have stayed with wayne and followed him around for less he would have been an origin halfback but he came over here and goes okay we're going to play this way you got a million dollars run the game and then a new coach comes in we're going to do this this way and like it's just like you're expecting him to have all the skills straight out of the bank and i was so critical of ash as well going ah, you know just because i love watching his play footy i wanted just to win and then as I took a deeper look at it, I was like, he, he's not getting Joey Johns like down at the storm, like or Cooper over here coaching him or, or Wayne, you know, bleeding him in and, and consistently coaching him. He's just getting pushed in this direction, this direction, this direction. He's 20 direction. years old. Yeah. The bloke, the bloke was 20 years old. Like, what do you expect? You expect a 20 year old player to, to come in and change the whole game. No, imagine like exactly what you just said. Imagine if he stayed with Wayne, put him in a Melbourne system, yep. put him under Trent Robinson, put him under a coach who has that experience, all those top tier players who he can learn from. Exactly. Right? He like, and it's, and it's sad to, and that's ties into the pressure. Yeah. Like the pressure of playing professional sport at such a high level and so young, like you're still trying to figure out yourself. Hey, I'm like 26. I'm still trying to figure out myself now. Mm -hmm. And then imagine being thrown into that world or that bubble, because it is a bubble. Professional sport is a bubble yeah. where you're earning a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, million dollars a year. And you got all this outside pressure of people wanting to you to perform, but it's that, but it's also the internal pressure that you're putting on yourself mm -hmm. to be that person. And you're probably, your identity's wrapped up into that. You might lose, you know, you might make mistakes around family or ma managing time. Or There's just so much that goes into it where you're putting everything into it. I would never, like, I would never knock someone for saying, oh, this guy's on a million dollars a season. He should take the team to the next level. No, nah, if, you if you get offered a million dollars a season, you're going to take the cash. Yeah. Uh, like, 100%. How, how do you walk away from that? Like, that would be a hard thing to walk away from because it, it sets you up. Like, that's a, that's a life-changing thing. Yes. And he obviously works so hard to get there. But, yeah, like you said, imagine putting him in, like, a Melbourne system or something like that. Like, that, that's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm, a, I'm with Rugby League. Take the money. Daily Cherry Evans, happy days, backflip. I'm all happy for it. Look after yourself. But whoever you sign for, it's, it's no longer – the one club, one person, man. It's a professional sport. You got to go where you go. It's it's a rotation. They'll, they'll you do your knee. I'll flick you. Look at Jimmy Ryan James at the end. Yeah, had enough him. See you later. Um, and he was and he killed it. And he just happened to do his knee because he was putting in so much effort. And then see you later. That's where? Right. So um, who just quickly? Who was the best out of those three? Neil Garf. I don't know, mate. Like I I've, I've got no idea. They all had different things. Like Neil, I didn't get enough of. Okay. I, I came into the back end of the season. I pretty much arrived and then he got sacked or he yeah. left or whatever the situation was. And then I had Breno. Breno was really passionate. And that's sort of my thing. Like I love, I love the passion. I love the aggression. And he sort of like feed, he fed into that. Not so much analytical as Justin. Justin's probably specialty is, is attacking, like an attack coach. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. They were all different. I couldn't say one was better than the other. 
Wayne was probably the best. Like when I was at Bronx, I, yeah. I signed my first professional contract when I was 17. Um, so that was a four year deal. So, you know, I went full time at 18, which was really cool. So I was training with the guys who I looked up to, like your Corey Parkers, Sam Thiday's, Josh McGuire's, Darius Boyd's, like, and that, so that team stacked. Alex Glenn, you know, Joey Carr, who like, look at the lineup, like they're mm. international origin players. So I came into that side just a bull at a gate like so competitive and i had got someone like wayne who is one of the most successful coaches in our era right but he just kills it and what he does really well is that he gets the players like he understands the players like he's not so analytical like he'll he'll really lean on like he'll come in when it's needed but he'll really lean on the assistant coaches but what he gets out of the players is so much more than what anyone else because he understands and he's so good with people like Talk to Jai Arrow and guys who actually played. I never got to play NRL underneath him. I only got to train yeah, with, in a full time system squad. with yeah. the top squad. I never got to play and make my debut for the Bronx. But talking to guys who are in it, they just like he would. I remember Jai Arrow was saying in his, in one of the matches he would just like he would do anything for Wayne. Like I think Wayne had a conversation before running out, and he's just like, I will do anything to win this game. Wow. Which is wild. Just on a word on that, like Wayne's how old's Wayne now? Seventies? In his seventies? Getting on, bro. I can't even fathom talking to a 20 year old now, let alone continually coaching young men to become adults, to not do something stupid, to not, you know, fuck up as an adolescent. If that was my life, that is a skill that is unbelievable. And it's, there needs to be more of it. I tell you right now, smart mentors, because we've got so many of this young generation that's coming up that, that doesn't understand how to be a man. It doesn't understand how to take responsibility for the action. And Wayne, to repeat that, I couldn't do it. Yeah. No way in the world could I just deal with the the, the youngness or the brains or, or like trying to figure out a 17 or 18-year-old now. Like, And for him to do that on repeat his whole life is – that's fucking amazing. Well, the best coaches do it well. Yeah. Greg Bellamy, Trent Robinson, you know, Wayne Bennett. Like I look at those three as probably the top – three coaches in the nrl right now and they're all people first yeah. like don't get me wrong they're amazing coaches and they do it really well but they just they've got rapport with the athletes they got rapport with their players they want them to do well out so they want their family lives to be right they want them to get their plan b their life around footy because when you're happy and you're playing football that's when you're playing your best footy is when you're happy you know you look at guys who go through the oh, ringer with yeah. you know with whatever it is family dramas finance dramas whatever it is like drinking too much well, like whatever it is you know when they're happy and everything's content in their lives, that's probably when they're playing the best footy. 100%. We just had Nikki Teller on here and she's a holistic. So she was looking at our diets and all that and our supplements and your bloods and all that last. She'll look at where's your stress, where's your financial, exactly what you said, where's your relationship stress. So there's this is one thing about professional athletes. I'll tell you right now that it's changed. You know, I used to have an edge in mind because I used to train 50% harder than I could see everyone's doing it. Doing a little bit of gym and all that. And I was like, sweet i'm gonna 10x this and i'm gonna be fucking sweet because i've got an edge there's no edge anymore everyone trains to they spew so how you get your edge now is your one percenters and it's not the one percenters it's training it's your sleep it's your diet it's your relationship if you have a, a poor relationship or a fight with your missus you think your training session is going to be good no if you're you know something's out of balance or line and that that is the new one percenters and like you said if you can get that happiness in everything sport life wife anything like business it just falls into line and i guarantee you every day is just a, a happiness and and it flows and 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 it just provides you know for you there's no stress there's no ah uh, in your gut everything that you just said is such like a nail on the head like it's everything, sleep, diet. And that's why I think we're going to start to see more psychologists move into the space. Like in the NRL and AFL system, even any professional sport, there's not really many full-time psychs involved, whether that being performance psych, whether that being positive psych, whether that's being someone, because like we said, everything is sorted outside of your footy or your sport, then your sport's going to be better. There's a psychologist by the name of Jackie Lauder, who's the Hollywood psychologist. She's been on board with the team for the last couple of years at Hollywood, and they're doing it probably the best that I've seen in any, like I, I, I have a lot of contact with a lot of clubs like around Australia with my work, with what ability. Regardless, we, we talk to a lot of the wellbeing managers and, and a lot of clubs and I call Jackie because I, I am really interested in the psychology and mental health space. Um, it's everything I'm doing with the podcast with Keegan and company and it's everything that I want to move into. I want to move into the mental health space. So I caught up with Jackie and we had a really great chat because I just wanted to hear how she goes about things in that professional environment. 
And mate, any time that a new player or a young kid comes through, she knows everything about them. She knows their academic grades. She knows if they have learning difficulties. She knows, you know, what they like to do. Like they, she knows everything about the player when they come on board. And then she can have conversations with them. So she's full time with the with the club. Like mm. she she was like she's got her own clinic, but she's full time with the club, which is so impressive. And they've obviously had so much success. Like they just won the preliminary final on Thursday night. So they're going through to the, the major semi or local grand final, whatever it is. And then but they're at the point now where the players was driving her to sit on the sideline during a game. Yeah. So now she's sitting with the assistant coach or whoever's on the sideline. So when players aren't having a good game, when the players need to come and have a conversation about their performance, they can come off, have a conversation with them. It's like, okay, what did we talk about last week? Like, where is our focus? Whatever tools that she's using. And that's all player driven. Like mm. if it's not player driven, it's not going to happen. So I'm really curious to see what the next 10, 20 years is going to look like. Are we going to see more cl- like psychologists in the, in the sporting world? The, in America and the UK are doing it great. Like you look at the NFL and basketball players, they've got two or three club psychologists that travel around with the team all year round. Mm. Like they're full time, like they're pretty much family and they've got the tools to be able to help them. Not only from looking everything outside of like outside sport, but then also like in that performance, po- so, like positive psychology space, which is so interesting. And it's so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. But cause it, what we brought up on was train hard, party hard, train harder. Yes. And or on the field, if there was a mistake, you'd feed it to the other person, absolutely feed it to them. And if they didn't feel right, it will come back at you. It was just that hard mentality. Yep. That's it. Deal with it. Go home. And, and look, there's a happy medium as well. Like too much psychology, I think you, you're relying on that person. So you've got to be able to sort of figure out your own problems as that because if you get out of this situation, you're talking to this chick two or three times a week and then she's not there. The best psychologist <laughs> gives you the tools for you to do it yourself. Yeah. That's the best psychologist and the best coaches will give you the tools so you can do it yourself. I'm actually on a different path at the moment. So I've been down that road, tools, bettering myself, everything like that. I'm go- <sighs> Here we go on the podcast. Um, I'm dealing with a chick over in, uh, in France, actually. Yeah. It's, you know, one of these different sort of ones and you just talk. Okay, she just leads you on this path. And it's basically like a self-discovery type of psychology. And it links things, what you're doing now, all the way back to what happened at school or a trauma there. And you just, I don't know if I like it yet because it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a journey, yeah. but it's just a different, and there's no tools. There's no answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just like that internal discovery. Because I'm always about how do I better myself? You know, if I've got an issue, let's sort it out. If I can't sort it out myself, which I'll try, you know, my ass off first. All right, let's try and get some help. Yeah, just this this journey and this new way of doing it, like thinking like that. It's um, oh, confronting, to my, say the least. My favorite thing about you is that when you do something, you're a hundred percent in. Yeah, the podcast, training, meals, cooking, smoking, like everything, everything you'd surfing, like smoking meats. By the smoking, way, I don't smoke. No, sorry, sorry, <laughs> smoking meats, smoking. I meant. <laughs> I'm not Joe Rogan here. I'm not sitting here. <laughs> I, like, met, I met smoking meat. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the best thing. But that's what I love about you, mate, is that everything that you do, you're a hundred percent in on. Yeah. Which I, which I really look up to, and I get a lot of inspiration from. It's good, but like anyone, it's so hard to stay up there. Yeah. And sometimes motivation comes, but that feeds this other monster that's down here that I call him the monster. Keep him away. You know, I have to be up here so he, the little man in my head, stays out. That's just, that's just how I run. But it's actually these two people combined. Mm. That they know each other and they know that this person needs to exist to bring this person down out of the 100%. So, so as soon as we do, it's like, bang. And then I need to change again. I'm like, oh, shit, I've let the monster take over. Bang. So the, and I'm, this is what I'm working with Nikki and all that, just to find that you still do everything 100%, but it's within balance and flow because – this is not a path to life. This is a path to life. You yeah. know what I mean? There shouldn't be so many setbacks and all that. And I find this in rugby league, all right? Because this is where we're going down with the Keegan and Co. It's all about the mental space, isn't it? Mm. So this is where we go with people after football who latch onto that identity. You find it in 28, 30, 35. How many people do you speak to who have, I'll call it a midlife crisis, or an, I shouldn't call it a midlife crisis, or identity crisis. Who am I? And you see them go down that wrong, wrong path. Drugs, alcohol, you know, still trying to find that aggression because they're not getting tackled every day and hit. What's your experience in seeing that around there? And let's jump into it. What's the Keegan and Co podcast about? Uh, Fill us in. Keegan and Co. So Keegan and Company. So it's all about the company you keep. Um, yep. It's a 
it originally started, I guess, as a, as a way to have conversation with, with athletes to help normalize the conversation of mental health, I guess, at, at the end of the day. I love mental health. Like I, I, I'm, I'm an ambassador for mental health. I sort of got into it when I lost a mate to suicide when I was 17, which I'm happy, which I'm happy to touch on. When I, was, when I was 17, we were going through the, the schoolboys competition and, and there was a guy by the name of Regan Grebe who we were both like, I guess, co-captains of the Queensland schoolboys team. Um, we we're playing in Darwin. He was obviously a good friend growing up. We were rooming together at that carnival. He's the guy who everyone looked up to. Like he was our captain. He was the guy who everyone loved, respected. He was funny. From the outside looking in, he has it all together. You know, he signed with Cowboys. You know, he was going on to do an NRL preseason. Like he was, he was just a, a guy who I really looked up to in the side. Anyway, we played the state. We say we played the state carnival. We both got picked up for the Australian schoolboys team, which was a six-week tour over in England and France, which is an insane opportunity. Yeah. Like, you, like you look at the guys who play in the Australian schoolboys competition, and more most of them go on and play NRL. Like I think in our side. Uh, 20 out of the 24 players went on to play in the NRL. And what an experience at that age as well. 17, 18 years old, traveling around England and France, playing tests against England, playing tests against France, getting to travel the world, which is wild. Anyway, Regan, Regan broke his leg at, in the state competition. So he got picked in the Australian schoolboy side, but he couldn't go overseas and travel, which is wild. And I guess that kind of started this downward spiral, which he went through. And I later found out that he was you know, in the hospital throughout that, you know, I guess – christmas new year period and they thought he might have bipolar but it was never fully diagnosed anyway he ended up committing suicide on the australia day of 2015 i remember getting a call from a friend kurt de lewis because we all we knocked around a bit together me regan and kurt i um, in that schoolboys competition and we were, we were really close and and it just took me by surprise mate like he, he maybe called me he's like regan's, regan's killed himself and it just hit me like a ton of bricks because he was a guy who i looked up to he was a guy that everyone loved but I, we just didn't know. Like I, like I roomed with this guy. I was, like, he was one of my, he was my best friend in in the side. Like he was someone who I looked up to, and I had no idea, mate. And so it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I was like, well, I'm never gonna let that happen again. I want to be the guy who, you know, I go through, and my mates can talk to, who, who, and and, and that was the thing that started with all the things that we did with Movember. Like I've been yeah. an ambassador with Movember for the last like seven, eight years. That's like we did those froth your mus events. Yeah. I remember at Wilderness yeah. where where we where we where we'd have a couple of beers and it, and it would all be around like mental health and normalizing the conversation, right? Because yeah. mate, like we've both been through it and we've both seen so many guys <laughs> who go through these mental struggles. So. So anyway, I've been an ambassador for November for the last eight years and I really want to lean into that mental health space. And more recently I found out, I was like, well, what, what can we do? Like, what are some like hands on like actual impact that we can make? I, was, I thought about having a podcast, but I was like, I didn't really have anything to say. I, well, I didn't think I did. I was like, I don't want to be adding to all the amount of shit content that's out in the world. And I've always been having great conversations behind closed doors, usually after a couple of hundred beers like, yeah. Yeah, with your mates, because you do. Like, that's what happens. You, yeah, you, you, let, you let the creation flow. You let the creation yeah. flow, but, but it doesn't have to just be on the beers. It could be surfing. Like when we go surfing or, or a run or a, over a coffee or going for or whatever it is. But I was having these really great conversations and I figured, well, all my role models and all my like people who I looked up to growing up were athletes. Like they're the most influential people in the world, I think. And so I thought, well, if they can be seen having these really tough, vulnerable conversations, then it makes it okay for us to be able to have these conversations. And a lot of them are mates, to be honest. Like I'm fortunate enough to have some friends who are doing some really cool things in the sporting space just from purely just being in it because it is a small world and growing up with them and, and, and being around that environment. So I thought, well, let's just sit down and go on this learning journey. So I'll sit down with, with mainly friends and people who are, I guess, kind of like high profile or who are doing some really cool things and letting them be vulnerable and letting them talk about struggles and everyone has different struggles and everyone's going through their own shit and everyone has their own journey but for them to open up and be vulnerable then it makes it okay for everyone else to to be vulnerable and that's and i guess that's the whole concept behind keegan and company and and i want to continue having these conversations and i want to continue to learn about this for me mate i'm not going into it thinking that i know everything I know fucking nothing, mate. I'm I'm on a learning journey. I'm here to learn. Like I'm never going to tell anyone like what to do because I don't know. Like I'm trying to get as much information from the guests that come on and trying to understand. So that's why like I'm going to go do my postgraduate of psychology because I want to understand the brain. I want to understand why we do certain things and have the tools to be able to help our mates mm. who will be coming out of professional sport or who still might be in it. 
because that's the whole thing. Like I, and even help my, like the stuff that I've been going through, like I want to have a better understanding about it. So having tools and frameworks to be able to help friends and families and crew who are going through it is, I guess, the long-term goal and dream and and i'll I'll go and i'm on a journey like it's it's a full journey it's not like you've got it all figured out because i don't but no i want to i really want to lean into that space the podcast is a really great way to have those vulnerable conversations to continue to normalize that yeah that to break down the barriers and stigmas of mental health because at the end of the day like it's just it's being able to open up and like a problem shared is a problem halved, which is, which is huge, mate. So yeah, that's what I'm sort of leaning into at the moment, mate. Do you find with athletes, speaking to athletes, when they're vulnerable, I found this on the podcast, they'll half explore it and you need to, you know, sort of coach them into, it's okay. You can talk about this as well here. And they'll get into the story about being a little bit vulnerable or about down that. And they're like, then they'll shut down. Okay. Oh, but I'm not playing the victim mentality. Yeah. Or like they just close back up as if they, we know, okay, we know you're a professional sportsman. We know there's so many more problems out in the world. You're not here to talk about the worst problems in the world or compare apples to bees and bees to, you know, barrels. But you're just here to talk about this. And, and this information can resonate with 20, 30 people here, 100 people. And if it does, that's worked okay we're not they always just close for me they close up real quickly once they sort of figure out what they're talking about and this is the athlete mentality as well stay strong stay stay on positive so i think what you're doing in this space is is massive massive because they need to understand and everyone needs to understand that you're not comparing yourself to the worst person you're you know it could be a completely different and worse off story there is but if you can just better yourself and then that puts you in a position to maybe help someone else and, uh, and it just spreads a hundred percent the the compounding effect and i think once you start to explain that to the crew that your message can actually impact and actually change people's lives then then they're more likely to be vulnerable and there's no such thing as forced vulnerability like you can't force someone to be vulnerable they've got to be vulnerable on their own on their own terms mm. but i think once you understand that yeah if i'm if i'm more open about my struggles that i'm going through then it validates other people and like even it could be something so small like i sat down with Braith and astar last week who has an incredible story like we we train every week and he's he's a really great role model and he's someone who i lean on for advice but he's mate he's obviously he's captained every side that he's played in he was rookie of the year in 2018. He's won grand final. He's the host of NRL 360. Like Play, plays off one play, as well with play, golf. Plays dog. off one. Yeah, yeah, he's a gun golfer as well. <laughs> but he's but he's he, from the outside looking in, you think he's got it all together. Yeah, I mean, he goes through the same struggles and everything. Like he lost his dad to suicide when he was 14 years old. <sighs> Went and played a golf tournament a couple of days later. Like how like you got fucking goosebumps thinking about and and for Braith to come on the podcast and to talk about his vulnerability. And I was like, mate, I was, cause I was a bit nervous. I said, mate, I, I don't know how to navigate. Like I'm, I'm cautious or I'm conscious about how to navigate this conversation. I was like, are you comfortable talking about your old man? And he's like, mate, I was, used to be never comfortable about it. Like when I was 14, 15, I just bottled it up. I put it in a drawer. I went and played golf the next day. I just gone on with it. And I moved on. And he's like, it all caught up with me later on. And I was like thinking, well, fuck, imagine how many crew, Man. How many kids are going to go through something similar, losing a parent, losing a kid? Like, and that's just one example of however many examples that there are in the world of people going through struggles because there are like, everyone's different. But for him to come on board and just be vulnerable and just talk about it and, and, and give like what he wish he did. He's just like, mm-hmm. I, he's like, I saw a psych, but I didn't really lean into it. He's like, I wish I was more open and I wish I talked about it and I wish I got it off my chest because I bottled it up. And he's like, and then, and then he talks about how he um, was voted the most overrated player when he was, I think, like uh, 20 or 21 uh, years old. I remember that. Which, which, and, but he's like, man, he was, he was like, he just won like five, eight of the year. He just won a comp or whatever. Like he was, he was having, he pretty much ticked every single box and then got overrated player into the year. And man, he almost gave the game away. Which yeah. is, mate, it's just wild to think about, and just to, and it mate, it's just a full circle. It shows like everyone who thinks they got it together, mate. We all go through our own struggles. We all go through our own shit, but it's it's how we respond and what what can we do to to fix it. Yeah, hundred percent. And he got voted. There was no internet back then. It was in the rugby league week. Your little fold out paper, and there'd be the inside page that they would do. Who's the most overrated player? And that's how they'd do it. Imagine if the internet was around. Wow, be wild, but yeah. man, the internet now you can't you can't be on it. You know what I mean? There's so many, but that just that 
like a new, goosebumps, like you said, losing your father. I was so lucky. You're so lucky. We got great dads. Very fortunate. Like, um, but Marky, same thing. Desi Menyon, unbelievable rugby league player, captain valleys for X amount of years, um, died at the age of 38. And dad was 18, okay? And then he had to navigate 18 to, you know, then having me and being a young father. And I think that sort of motivated him to be such a good father with that. Mm. But he missed out on that. And I always just think, oh, I, I can't even fathom losing your dad. Yeah. He's here every day, plays with Sonny. We build everything together. He's taught me every, you know, skill that I know with him building. He taught me how to surf. He taught me how to play rugby league. Like, I, I just couldn't fathom my braith or us like going through life without it man it's imagine just... imagine not having that mentor to lean on oh. that, and like and that's why and he and braith talks about like having people around like having mentors and having people to lean on is huge yeah like it, like it really is huge but like talking like talking to people is a great way having like like male role models in your life as well whether that being a coach whether that being a school teacher whether that being whatever it is going through like we, we do need that like i think we i think we really do need that growing up not 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 really we a hundred percent Hundred percent, we do. Paul Harrigan. I had um, my dad, but I also had Scott Park as well. So Parky played with Manly Crushers, came back to the Sunshine Coast, and I was a little surfy rat. He taught me how to train. So he was doing these Sunday things, basically training us young kids on this is what it's like in the NRL, and that sort of clicked. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is how you got. But without him, I, I don't know which path I'm going on. But that was that mental thing. And there's not enough of them out there. There's not enough coaches. And it's such a hard, you know, like you need to have those mentors in your life and you need those male role models and that and setting on your right, right direction because it can be the, it can be make or break within your life. It can be the difference between a, a really good path and a really good direction. Right? And everyone's searching for them. The problem with it is now is there's so many on the net. Here, buy this course, buy this thing. If I can tell anybody on the internet, do not buy a course that sells how to make a course. That's not mentorship. That's not you know, whatever's on there. No, go find a strong man leader around there or, or something that you want to do, a businessman, um, if you want to get into this industry or the mental health industry, especially young men, go find them, go hang off their side for three to six months for free and just do whatever they want. I'll guarantee you, you are getting paid, not in dollars and cents, you are getting paid in life skills and lessons that is going to teach you immensely throughout your life. Change your life direction. It's wild, man. And everyone, everyone thinks that they're a coach now without having the experience and back up to, to do it right like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna take advice from someone who hasn't been there and done it that's you know, right like i'm i'm like i i have i'm lucky to have really good people around me and these guys are you know you have 10 20 30 40 50 years on me maybe not 50 maybe 40 <laughs> but you know what i mean like these guys have been there and done it and i guess when i'm looking for someone to look up to or someone who i want to emulate they've done what i want to do whether that being in football, whether that being in business, whether that being in the mental health space, physical space. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take fitness advice or like gym advice from someone who hasn't lifted a day in their life or or who may have been in the gym for the last year. Yeah. You know, insane. it's it's pretty wild. But I love what you said, like having having good, strong role models around you who tie into your values is is huge. Yeah. And I always say that as well, like that's young. We, we have so many lives. Our lives, your, your rugby league life is, well, it's not over because you're still in it, but that part of your life is, is over. You know, you're now growing into the mental space, the podcast and helping everyone. This is like a, a second life. So you've dedicated, you know, since you were balls deep in rugby league, six years old. So you've still done, you know, 20 years in that industry. Now you're going to do 10 in this. You're going to be three into knowing what you're doing. You're going to be five. You're going to be an expert. 10, you're going to be, you know, a professional who can help you. And then we might restart and start something else. Okay, let's try this in life. You, you, that's for me. That's I need to touch everything within my life. I need to experience everything. That's just who I am as a person. I, like I've got the surfing skill, but I'm not surfing as much anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm throwing myself into this. I'm throwing myself into boxing. I'm just finding that learning and ability. And I think in life, we just need to continue to grow and not be scared to be an amateur again. Not be scared to go back to point one. Not be scared to, you know, learn something you've never done. Shout out to my cousin, by the way. Always been in the background, done nothing. Sam, well done. Went and did a real estate course. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's worked in coffee shops, nightclubs her whole life. She's had three kids and she's just clicked it. Like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And she's completed the course. So, but that I just continually edge people. Like, 
hit reset. If you've lost it all, hit reset. Go again. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Who cares? I I had a real, I had someone who I really looked up to. He was a, he was a chef for like 20 years, 20, 30 years, like owned and bought, like bought and owned restaurants. Um, It's a hard life. It's a hard, mate. That's the thing. It's a hard life. He had three young kids, a wife, partner. So the wife and partner were just one. He only had one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he, he got to, I think like 35 or four, maybe like 40 years old. And he's like, I can't, this is not sustainable. I'm so, 40 this year too, Keggs. That's what I mean. But he's like, it's yeah. not sustainable. I'm going to go down the um, pharmacy route. So he ended up being a pharmacist, um, went to uni with three young kids. And and after seeing that, I remember thinking, there's no excuse. Like, you're never too old to start something. I love what you said, that it's, it's okay to come back and hit a reset button on some things. Yeah. And, and, and just start that learning and understand the fact that you are – like you are going to be fresh and you are going to be new and it's okay to not be the best at everything. Cause I think that's, that's something that probably I struggled with coming out of sport. Like yes. I came out, I was like, I've just got it. Well, I was in the top zero, zero, one percent of, you know, people who play rugby league to go on up to professional. Like I need to be the best at this right away. And that's something that I think I'm starting to learn that it's like, no, it's okay to not be the best, but yes, it's okay to want to be the best, but take that little step back and like, okay, well, what's, what's the line? Like, how do I actually, right. how do I actually get there? And, and am I putting the, my best foot forward in doing certain things and yep. taking the right actions? And that's not just in, you know, your chosen trade or craft or, or what you're doing. That's in yourself as well. It is, is my path better than the day before? I mean, Goggins and that, they all speak about it, you know, 1% better than the other. It, it's legitimately the only thing that you should be doing. 1% better, 1% better, 1% better than the day before. Am, am I, like you said, on that trajectory, on that path? I but, love it. But it's with everything. It's like being a dad, being, yeah. being, being a son, being a f- good partner. It's not just like your job occupation because, you know, like you can, we talked, you mentioned briefly about identity, like people coming out not having identity, like athletes get so wrapped up in like sport being their whole identity and that's not them. What I'm starting to realize, I guess, is that no, when I'm, when I'm happy and when I'm ticking boxes in my family life, in my personal life, in my mindset, am I managing my stress? If I'm ticking all those boxes, then everything else lifts as well, mm. right? which is, which is super important. And don't get me wrong, like have goals, be ambitious like do whatever you want to do in your chosen field whether it's business whether it's sport whether it's whatever it is but like make sure make sure there's a balance between like your family life make sure there's a balance between like looking after your own mental well-being your own physical well-being like i think it's all related yeah and i always say that to everybody as well i believe anybody can do anything it's just time do we have enough time you know what i mean so obviously if you want to be an astronaut you're gonna have to dedicate your whole life to be an astronaut You, you can be it That's my mentality. If I want to be amazing on the guitar, I've just got to play the guitar for 16 hours a day for the next, you know, two years and I'll be pretty fucking good. You know, anything that you want to do for you. So there's, there's no boundaries. This podcast, learning social media, learning how to set up cameras and that, this is a skill that I've developed. I was a dirty old rugby league renderer. Okay. (laughs) Who built a company and who now has a podcast speaking to amazing people like you and about the podcast. How good is podcast? And mate, it's a beautiful setup you've got here as well. Just while we're here. (laughs) Mate, I started with $15 Kmart speakers years ago, but podcasting is, is so good because like you said, I don't know everything, but I'm grabbing information from you. And then I'm speaking to all these amazing people and going, and they're sharing the energy and their stories and that I'm just getting smarter and smarter just by listening to people. And then you go, all right, what about this? And they go, oh yeah, I know about that. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, that was good. Thank you. Thank it's you. Thank like you. Free, it's like free education. Free education. It's like layers of paint that build a mountain, right? It's like every conversation, every action that you do is just like a little layer of paint. And then you do that over one year, yeah. over three years, five years, a decade. Imagine if you do this for 10 to 20 years. Imagine the volume of like knowledge and growth that you're going to have which is so cool, man. I, I, I really love the setup and I really love what you're doing yes. here. It's really cool, bro. Thank you, bro. Mate, I, I want to touch on, on your retirement, if we can. Yep. Um, talk about the concussions and that because it's something that I'm starting to struggle with now, I'm, you know, just grabbing information. And this is all about the head knocks. I've had one huge concussion when I was a kid. We we're actually on a swing, one of the ones that just go up and down, round and round, and you hold onto the side. And as it goes up, your legs swing out and all good. I've come off that, bang into a pole, knocked out cold for three days. Like, when's Christmas? When's Christmas? They reckon I asked that a million times. Rugby league, getting the knee and the head, finding the $2 in the grass. Where is it? Oh, I think it's there. There it is. For you, being in that, that forward position, that impact, that shake all day, every day, you've had a couple of bad ones, 
what was it on the last one or, or how did this all come about your retirement and the decision? Well, I think it's a, I think it's an ongoing thing, right? Like I've, I've had a lot of head knocks throughout my career. Like people ask me how many head knocks have you had? I couldn't tell you. Like honestly, I couldn't tell you how many head knocks I've had. I had a bunch when I played, went overseas and played in the Australian schoolboys. Had a bunch when I was a kid who obviously back times were different back when we played, right? Like it wasn't so diagnosed and it wasn't so looked after. And usually like I just thought a head knock was like the same as a shoulder injury or a cork and you just mm. you just get on with it. In under 20s, I had a fair few. I couldn't tell you how many I had when I was playing at the Gold Coast Titans um, in 2019. I had three big ones, a lot of ones that went undiagnosed, like because you, mate, it's not just a full diagnosed concussion. It's all the micro head, all the micro hits, all the micro shakes. the shakes, the, the, shakes, the every shakes. every time we do a tackle, every time we go up for a hit up, every there's so many of those little ones that accumulate. Anyway, in 2019, I had three big ones where I was pretty much fully knocked out, had some really big symptoms where like my emotions would be like a roller coaster. Like I'd be really happy, then really sad. Um, I was re- becoming pretty forgetful. I was, I was struggling, I guess, like to, I guess, like manage my energy levels, I guess. So um, anyway, the protocol is when you have three big concussions, you got to go off and see a neuropsychologist, yep, a neurologist. Um, so I went through, did the brain scans, did the testing, and he obviously looked at all the vision and he said, your brain needs a break. You need to have six months off. So I had six months off, which turned to 12 months when COVID hit. And so I had the 12 months off anyway, but I was hungry to come back and play. Like, you know, you mate, you know what I was like. I was like, I'm not going to, like, nothing's going to stop me. Came back the fittest I'd ever come back. Like, I was, you know, I was, yeah. I was didn't, didn't you what? Holy I was, shit. Oh, man, I, can't, I was, it was the fittest I'd ever been. Um, I was, you know, winning all the, all the fitness tests coming back in, um, end up playing the 2020 season at the Titans. Played, I think I was playing really good footy. And then anyway, at the end of the season, moved on to the Parramatta Eels um, in 2021. Same thing. Like they, they were a pretty good side, mate. Like they had Regan Campbell-Gillard, Junior Polo, Nathan Brown, Sean Lay, Ice, Papa. Like he, they had a, a cracking side. And so, mate, to be honest, I was just happy to be in a winning side, playing in the semifinal side. I wanted to win a grand final. But same thing, I had three big head knocks. Like three, and my last one, was against uh, Penrith Panthers in round 26 um, in the 2021 season. Um, and I remember we were defending our try line and, and Tavita Pangai did like a really hard unders line and I was the back row. And so I had to jam in on him and obviously came off second best. Like Tavita's a big boy. Um, and so I, I got, so I came off second best and my thing was the whiplash that came back and hit the ground. And, yeah. the, and you can look at a clip, like you can just you can pretty much Google any you know, kick and hit grave, you know, concussion and it'll come up and I was fully I was out cold um but that's when I really like I've always noticed the symptoms but that's when I had my worst symptoms like I had a headache for like six to eight weeks afterwards obviously like we were going on to play semi-finals so I was I knew that I was ruled out I knew that I wasn't going to play semi-finals um because of all the previous concussions that I had even just trying to do like a return like a very easy return to play protocol like and that and that's what that looks like is pretty much just like light light weights it might be like a hundred meter jog like a light jog um but i couldn't even get through that without getting a headache or without feeling fatigue and every time i do a session i would just go sleep for the rest of the day and so that and so that was it and the mate the big one that got me was when i was going to see my granddad we because we we got like the covid happened we, we were living on the gold coast like the whole comp got moved to like Queensland pretty much so I was back living on the Gold Coast which I was loving I was back with my friends and family it was great but I remember going to see my granddad who wasn't doing that great at the time and I remember just being real agitated like I remember just being like really angry and and but it's weird because like I knew that my brain was recovering like I'd been through it before I knew that I just had to give it time but I was just angry and I was irritable and little things were setting me off and I remember going in to see my granddad who I didn't think at the time he's still kicking but I didn't think he had that much long that lack left and it was his birthday or some sort of event and I remember just sitting there like I even at like with my family and just being angry and I had no, and I, but it was weird because I was conscious about it and then I went back and then obviously the lunch finished up and I left and I was sitting in the car and then I just broke down. I remember thinking like, fuck, like, why am I so, like, why am I so angry? Like, I'm, this is probably one of the last times I'm going to get to see my granddad. Like, and it was just, it was just one of those moments where I was like, fuck, my brain is actually, it's, it's still recovering. Like it's, and so anyway, I had to go see the neurologist because it was my third big concussion. Did the same test that I did a couple years prior. Um, and we had just some big conversations. Like he was just like, look, you know, you're, you're 24 years old. You've got a lot of stuff going outside of footy. He's just like, He's like, I, in my professional opinion, like I recommend that you should medically retire from rugby league. Um, 
And How is that pill to swallow here and that? Well, mate, that's that's the thing. Like, it's obviously hard. It's hard to think, but mate, I I, I agreed with him. Yeah. Like, I, like I fully agreed with him because, mate, like I, mate, I wanted to be, I want to be good when I'm. 40, 50, 60, 70. Like I want to be good when I'm down the track. I want to be, you know, um, I want to be able to hang out with my kids one day. I want to be able to articulate my thoughts. I want to be able to do well in business. I want to do well in psychology. I want to be able to help people. And I was like, I want to, st- like you, I want mm. to be the best that I can be. And if I, what's going to, what's going to help me if I go on and do a couple more years of playing professional footy and keep getting these head knocks? Like how, how much is that going to hurt me later on in life? And so to be honest, mate, like, it was, yeah, of, of course it was a tough pill to swallow. I love rugby league. Like I, I love being around my mates all day. I love that competitive atmosphere. Like as you know better than anyone, mm. like being in that space, like it, it's such a privileged p- position to be in yeah. and to play, not even just to play rugby league, but just to be in a professional environment. Like it is a privilege. And so, but I was just like, well, like what are my priorities in life? My priorities is is having meaningful work, meaningful relationships. I want to be a good partner. I want to be a good son. I want to be a good dad one day. And so continuing to play rugby league is going to detriment my values and, and, my, and what I want to do. So yeah, it was a tough, it was a tough, you know, thing. So I agreed with the neurologist. Um, at this point, everyone, you know, the, the competition had finished, like the, the, ga- the games had wrapped up. So everyone, like when you finish up, everyone usually just goes travel. So um, I wasn't around the boys anymore. I was just around like my, my friends and family. Um, so I had some tough conversations with my family. I wanted to lean on what they were doing or what they thought. And yeah, we just come to the conclusion that I should retire. And I remember, I remember it so vividly um, having the phone to being on the phone to Brad Arthur, because that was one of the first times that I said out loud to anyone else besides my family that I was going to medically retire from the footy. Like I spoke to the neurologist, we agreed, um, we're going through that process. And then um, I called Brad and he, he missed the call. And then he called me back like maybe five minutes later. And then I told him, I was like, man, I think I'm going to like medically retire from footy. And I was just like, I'm, like, I don't know why I feel like I'm crying now. Yeah. Like two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I remember, I remember like just breaking down and he was just like, he's like, mate, like we, like we love footy. Like footy is what we love, but it's not everything. Like it's, it's, it's really not, it's not everything. Like, yeah. bit, like you, like you got to look after yourself. You got to look after your family. And that just stuck with me. And mate, the club was so good. Like the boys were so good. I, I caught a few of my like really close friends in the team. I had to tell the whole team through a WhatsApp. Like usually when someone retires, you know, they're in the team environment, they're in the theater room or they're on the field yeah. or, and they're, and they're, everyone's together and they get around you. But I couldn't do that because everyone was out, like everywhere around the world or, yeah. or in Sydney or Goldie or whatever they were. So I had to tell them like over a WhatsApp message and mate, the love, that I still got from those guys and the club, like the club, like the boys would, would always call, like they would always reach out and they, they, they were just there for me, mate, to be yeah. honest, they were just there for me. And then even the club to keep me around, like I still do work with Parramatta Eels as an ambassador role. I, I love the club, like like even from from the uh, CEO and, and and front staff to the boys and and the trainers and, and the guys who strap our ankles. Like I've got so much love for that club. Um, that's why I'm still involved. And they're probably the ones like they could have just, you know, all right, yeah, get out of here. Like you yeah, just retired. Right. I, mean, I was only there for a year. It's not like I was a 10 year player. No, that's also, right. But they just, they, they just looked after me and that's why I've got a lot of love for them. But yeah, mate, like I, yeah, it was a tough time, but I think, yeah, we, we learn from these types of experiences and, and I've definitely learned more and I made, I wouldn't change it at all. Like I've learned so much in these last two years and I'm so excited about the next five, 10, yes. 20 years. Like I'm like, if anything was a blessing in disguise, to be honest, mate, like I, I don't, yeah, I don't regret anything that I've done in footy. Like I love everything that I've done, but I'm so excited for the next chapter. Yeah. Mate, <laughs> I was dear enough. <laughs> yeah, mate, no. I was weird. I've never fucking <laughs> teared up telling that story. Oh, mate, that's just, you know, us and the passion yeah. that comes with it. And I, you took me, I felt like I was retiring again. Like, <laughs> I, I felt like I was you retiring, I should say. And I was just like, oh, man, because it breaks your heart. It does. It breaks when you've got so much energy and love for that, for something, you know, and you're attached yourself to it. Um, to relive it, it's, it's insane. Like, um, we bury a lot of that. We bury, you know, how good that sort of part of your life was. And that's the one thing I say. I just, I just miss the sheds. That's the one thing I get. I'm, you know, I went back to rugby league late after surfing, but – the one thing is just that mateship and everyone like getting on your on your back and just having the boys around and mm. and and then the upbeat energy and it's like there's no problems in the world at, in rugby league 
when, when you're training or in the sheds or anything. There's zero problems, is but, there? But yeah, yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. But also being able to find that elsewhere, like, yeah. like even like, like you running with bugs in this morning, like being able to, being able to have that. I guess community and having that mateship around like that's something I think that's why a lot of guys struggle because they they don't have it they go from every day for the last you know since I was 17 18 year old kids to being however old they are mid 20s 30s early 30s when they retire they're in that group environment and then they just don't have anything and just drops off but like the best thing about training is being around your mates. Yeah. Like that's the best thing. So being able to have that thing to fall on, whether it's, you know, going for a run with a mate, whether it's training in groups, group settings, playing social touch, like whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think there are, there are ways to, to navigate around that. Yeah, we do. About the concussion. I, I'm dealing with this as a dad now. What do I want Sonny to do? I mean, I love rugby league. He's loving watching rugby league. You know what he loves more? Dust, dust. Dust, dust. Pow, pow. Yeah. Dust, dust. He watches all the fights. Just like his old boy. <laughs> now, I've broken this down. I've actually thought about the numbers, okay? I might actually want him to do fighting. The, the consequence at the end, being knocked out, there's is dangerous. But I guarantee you're going to get knocked out just as many times in rugby league. And this is where the difference between – I broke it down between boxing, rugby league, and NFL. Boxing – you're not sparring all the time. You're training. You do, you know, every sparring now and then, you're getting a couple of taps. So it might be the shake that we talk about in your brain. Your brain doesn't have a seatbelt, so it's actually the shake that damages. It's not the, you know, the big impacts make your brain swell, but it's just the consistent shake, shake, shake. And this is where all the CT comes into it. <coughs> CTE, sorry. Um, so boxing, maybe, maybe 10 a week, maybe 20 a week. You know, 50, 52 town, that's 1,000 a year over, you know, 10, 20 years, 20,000 shakes. Rugby league, tackling practice, shake, five times, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times at training, plus on the weekend, you're doing 20, 30 tackles. You're in the thousands a week of the shakes, okay? 50, 50 weeks a year, 50,000, you're up in the 300, 400,000. NFL, and this is why it's such a big drama in the NFL, NFL is one-on-one -on -one impact, every single play. You're not in every single tackle in rugby league. You're not in every single play. You're tipping on your thing. You're doing a couple of tackles, happy days. You got a little bit of contact. Every play in NFL is a one-on-one -on -one situation. Outside receivers crossing over, pushing off, the hitman in the middle, which is the main ones. Every play. Every play at training, every play in the game, every play. So they're getting like something stupid. Like I think it was like 70,000 shakes a week. And then times that by a year, times that by 20, 30 years that they play the game since they're 10. That's why there's brain problems and injuries. So as a father and like pushing someone into sport, because he's going to love sport. Mm. But which one would I rather go down? I'm leaning towards fighting, to be honest. Because fighting also has discipline. There's a lot of NRL players, and I'll call it out now, big, tough guys, strong. Yes, they could probably beat nine times out of 10. Do not know how to fight one little bit. Walk around, no one. You get into fighting and you understand the art of it and that – calmness you're calm in a situation you understand that there's always someone more dangerous out there a lot of rugby league players don't understand that and then you watch them th like stand up and throw some fight and, like, and i'm not by any means a, a professional trainer fighter boxer or anything like that so i'll put that out on the table now but I also know how calm i became once i understood what the body could do and and, and how to you know use it in in force um before that i was a scared little boy <laughs> trying to trying to you know run around and go, oh, big and tough and stuff like that but yeah, I think that's why a lot of people like grab, especially young males, gravitate towards that like boxing, jujitsu kind of kind of style because it's a way for them to unleash, I guess, this like built up aggression. But mate, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to navigate that conversation. Like, I'm not a dad. I don't know. Yeah. I I don't know. I I that's the big. That's probably the biggest topic for for parents probably at the moment, like whether to put their kids in contact sport, like, cause the, the codes are seeing it. They're seeing a drop in grassroots participation yeah. due to the conversation around CTE, around, around traumatic head brain injuries around. Yeah. Obviously like TBIs and everything like that. So I'm probably on a learning curve to figure it out. Like that's why I want to go down psychology. That's why I want to have a bit more understanding around uh, brain health, I guess. It's obviously very aligned with, with my concussions. So, mate, to be honest, like I don't have an answer right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to go on a journey to, to help figure it out because I think as a parent, you just want your best for your kid. I imagine. I imagine that's just what yeah. you, you want your what's best for your kid. And I know that there's a lot of really great tra traits and attributes that you get from boxing, that you get from playing sport, being in a team environment, 
but then there's also the the conversation around head knocks and around what's that going to do later later in life or even even during life like even when you're in it um so mate too, yeah I'm, I'm not sure how yeah I'd, I'd say anyone who's listening or has kids or you know knows someone playing sport i'd just say if there's one thing you're worried about concussion just count the shakes mm-hmm. all right go, go to train and count the shakes at footy train and count the shakes and you know sort of do a little bit of research in the back of that i think there are some really great research coming out and i think the more like we're we're in our infancy right especially with female like female sport coming yeah. in like, that's a whole nother conversation like i think we're really going to start to see more research around it um because we are in our infancy so yeah i think yeah i don't don't have the answer uh, yeah it's all happening. look um i named him sunny anyway so if he's not a professional surfer i don't yeah, know what he's we, gonna do he's, i'll just live all my dreams through him no, he, had, he, had, he had his surfboard out before he's gonna be he's gonna be in the water 100 ah, yeah. percent. man we got to do more surfing i'm telling you right we on. we have to do more surfing that's the soul like you said it cleans the soul it does that Mate, I want to keep you going. I want, I want to, you know, keep getting in touch. Like, keep, you know, exploring. Hey, Keegs, what's Keegan and Co doing now? I can't. If anybody's out there, I can't push this enough. The man is on a mission. <laughs> You're doing the a million percent the right thing. You've got all your friends on the back end of it, and you've got some great production and great content. Anybody out there, jump over Keegan and Co. Um, you can, you know, look him up, Keegan Hipgrave on Instagram. Follow all his socials and do all that. But, mate, have you got anything to add or? Mate, that's I just thank you. I guess thank you for letting me share my story. Thank you for letting me be vulnerable. I feel obviously very comfortable with you to have these yeah, conversations. <laughs> um, that's why, mate, I think that's why the Keegan and Company, like the podcast works because a lot of them are just mates. So um, they're probably a little bit more open to have conversations like what we're having today. So, mate, thank you for allowing me to come on and, and have this conversation today. Thank you for letting me be vulnerable and, mate, keep crushing it. I love I love where your head's at. I love the energy you bring. I gave you a big hug when I came in because I miss yeah, you, How man. good was it? I was uh, like, oh, because – we speak, but I didn't. I haven't been able to see you, and mate, just that touch and the feel. I, I, I miss. Like, ah. I miss seeing you, mate. Um, I got a yeah. lot of love for for you and and for your fam. So, mate, thanks, thanks for having All me. All right, that's good. Cheers, Kegs. Yes, <laughs>